decir rápidamente sobre el doctor López. Es que él es el director asociado del Centro Hispano Pew y profesor en la Facultad de Política Pública de la Universidad de Maryland. Se especializa en la economía laboral, la participación cívica y el comportamiento electoral y la economía de la educación. Este centro es un centro muy reconocido nacionalmente. Cada vez que se hace cualquier tipo de presentación, investigación, sobre todo en cambios demográficos, etc., este es el centro más respetado eh, a nivel nacional y tenemos, tenemos mucha suerte de que el doctor eh, López vive aquí en nuestra área y que eh, también este quiso entregarnos esta mañana esta presentación. Así que, bueno, les voy a dar entonces el chance de oír eh, un poquito sobre los cambios demográficos y también por qué es tan importante que estemos aquí hoy. Uh, buenos días, ¿cómo están? Uh, it's great to be here. I want to say thank you for the opportunity to be here. One more announcement. If anybody needs a headset for the translation, uh, there are still some headsets available, so please let us know if you need something. Um, my name is Mark Lopez, and I'm the Associate Director of the Pew Hispanic Center here in Washington. I'm going to talk to you today about many different things, including demographic changes nationally, but also many things that are happening in the Washington, D.C. area and Montgomery County specifically. Um, I'm also a resident of Montgomery County, so it's great to see all the things happening here today and to see everybody here interested in talking about Latino youth, particularly in Montgomery County. So I look forward to your questions and comments, and I hope, <laughs> and I hope, I need to slow down, I talk fast, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, I hope that you find this useful And should you have any questions, feel free to contact us at the Pew Hispanic Center. We are here to provide information. So let's get started. Um, first, next slide, next slide. First, I want to tell you a story. Uh, next. I want to tell you a story, a story about demographics in the United States. Latinos are a big part of this story. And when we, uh, Latinos are a big part of this story and When you take a look at the demographic growth over the last few decades, the nation's Hispanic population grew uh, from about uh, 14 million in 1980 to over 50 million in 2010. That growth is among the fastest, if not the fastest, depending on the decade, in the nation's minority groups. Particularly when you take a look at today, Latinos, are the nation's largest minority group, making up 16%, next slide, 16% of the nation's population. Next slide. Whoops, hit it again, I'm sorry. It looks like the animations didn't work. One more, there you go. Um, 16 million of the nation's uh, uh, more than 300 million uh, people. The, La the Latino population has been the nation's largest uh, since 2000. And in fact, in the last decade, Hispanic population growth accounted for more than half of the nation's population growth. So when we're talking about a growing America demographically, Latinos are a big part of that story. And not just in California and Texas, but around the nation. Next slide. To give you some sense of where this is coming from, where this growth is happening the fastest, Here's a list of the states that had the fastest Hispanic population growth in the last decade. You'll notice there's a pattern. Many of these states are in the southeast. Places like South Carolina, more than doubled. Alabama, Tennessee, Kentucky. But notice that Maryland is also on this list. Maryland's Hispanic population during the decade doubled. It grew by 106%. So Maryland is a big part of this growing and this changing demographic story of the United States. Next slide. To give you some sense of where all of this is happening, this map shows you where the fastest growth happened. The states in yellow are the states with the fastest growth. The lighter colored states are the states with the slowest growth. But you should notice something. California, in tech, uh, California New Mexico, Illinois, New York, New Jersey, large Hispanic states grew slowly during the last decade in their Hispanic populations compared to places like Maryland. So when we're talking about this population growth, it is also a story of dispersion. Hispanic, the Hispanic population is dispersing around the country. Next slide. Let me give you a sense of how this is happening. 
Here's the distribution of the Hispanic population in 1980. The larger the bubble, the bigger the population. Next slide. This is in 1990. Next slide. 2000. Next slide. 2009. Now, the 2010 numbers, we're compiling them now, but the story is going to look very much like this. What you should also notice is that there's Hispanic population growth virtually everywhere. Next slide. To show this to you in a different way, between 1980 and 1990 and 2000, I'm sorry, some of the fastest Hispanic population growth happened in places like North Carolina. At that time, your phone has to be up. Okay, Is that better? You mean I wasn't yelling loud enough? <laughs> um, at that, that time, North Carolina was actually referred to as a new destination state. But, next slide. Now look at what's happened in the last decade. You see growth almost every, in every single state, even Alaska. There are Latinos in Alaska. <laughs> so uh, I haven't been to Alaska myself, uh, so I don't know. But uh, as you can tell, there's also been growth in counties in Alaska in the nation's Hispanic population. To put it another way, virtually every county in the country saw its Hispanic population increase in the last decade. Um, North Carolina, again, I want to point it out. It's still growing fast, but it's no longer a new destination state. We actually call it an old new destination state because Georgia has actually surpassed it as a large uh, Hispanic state. Next slide. Speaking of Georgia, Georgia is actually one of the nation's top 10 Hispanic states. It's almost as large as New Mexico in terms of its Hispanic population. You, you probably don't associate Georgia with a Latino population that's among the largest in the country, yet it is one of the top 10. Um, where does Maryland rank on this? Well, Maryland's Latino population is at 471,000. It's the 18th largest in the country. Okay. Um, I also want to, next slide, next. I want to show you something about the distribution of ages. Sort of what is a Latino population like? Well, what's interesting as well about the last 10 years is that it has gotten a little bit younger. Um, in fact, Latinos now represent a larger share of the nation's children than they did back in 2000. 23% or one in four nearly of all the nation's children are Hispanic. Uh, that's a big change. If you take a look at newborns just a few years ago, one in four nationwide of newborns were Hispanic. Next. And just... Uh, okay, one more. I'm sorry. And next. I think you got to do two more. One. Uh -huh, one more. There you go. Sorry about the animations. You know, you want the animations to work, and they just don't work. Um, now, you can see that things have changed since 2000. With Hispanic population growth, a lot of that growth, which has come from, frankly, actually more has come from native-born births than from immigration. Immigration is still important, but it's really children born in the U.S., that is really driving Hispanic population growth. And that's only going to become more of part of the story as we move forward. The 80s and 90s, Hispanic population growth driven by immigration. Now, this decade, it's birth to uh, Hispanic parents that's driving Hispanic population growth. Next slide. To give you some sense of how young the Latino population is, here are two age pyramid profiles. One is for Hispanics, looks like a pyramid. That's because Latinos are young. And the other one is for white non-Hispanics. The Hispanic population has a median age of 27. For white non-Hispanics nationally, 42. There's a big difference. And you can really see it when you talk about how the number of Hispanic voters is changing. Did you know, by the way, people make fun of me because I go to cocktail parties or dinner, and I throw these facts out there. I say things like, did you know? Um, and so here's, here's one of those did you knows. Um, uh, did you know that about 60,000 young Latinos turn 18 every month? Now, if you think about that, there are more white non-Hispanics who turn 18 every month nationally. That's true because it's a larger population. However, the number of Hispanics eligible to vote between 2008 and 2012 has increased by over 2 million people. So, and this is a process that we're going to continue to see for two to three decades through 2050. So the Hispanic electorate is growing and it's growing rapidly. And a lot of those young people 
are U.S. born. So they're eligible to vote right away because they're U.S. citizens. So just keep that in mind when you think about these dynamics of the Latino population, that it's growing and that it's growing fast and that it is young. Um, what's also interesting, next slide. What's also interesting is when you take a look within the Latino community. Within the Latino community, if you take a look at the native born, native born Latinos, their median age is 14. The median age of the foreign born is more like 35. So when you take a look at the Latino population that's native born, the future, the future of the Latino community and, and everything that's gonna happen is still gonna happen. Uh, let me say that a different way. Things are still to come. Many things are still to happen um, because we got so much youth and so many young people who haven't even turned 18 yet. As we move forward in time, Latinos will become a larger share of the youth population and a larger share of the adult population. That will happen through 2050. Next slide. Speaking of which, here's what's happened through about 2009 in terms of Hispanic population growth. Next slide. Here's what we predict will happen in to, to 2050 of Hispanic population growth. We expect the Hispanic population to be 128 million by 2050. Next slide to show you how this cha these changes are gonna change the composition of the United States, we project, and this would even happen if immigration were to stop today, by the way, we project that Latinos will be 30% of the nation's population by 2050. They're gonna almost double their share by 2050 of the nation's population. So if you think about that, that means many things. Hispanics are growing faster than the general US population, it's a younger population, but also, uh, that the future will be one where we will have uh, a, a, an adult population that is at least a quarter, if not more, Latino. So a quarter of workers, a quarter of all adults, a quarter of voters will be Latino come 2050. Any questions, by the way? Very interesting. <laughs> Great. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, I want to talk about uh, some other trends, though, because there's some other interesting things that are happening because there are challenges and there's a lot of optimism within the Latino community, but there also are uh, challenges that are out there. First, here's another one of my did you knows. Oh. <laughs> did you know that 41% of Latino households are cell phone only? Hispanics are leading the way when it comes to being a wireless, what we call a wireless household, a household that only uses cell phones. Some have even said that Hispanics are in the lead when it comes to adopting mobile technology. But I want to point out that even though Latinos are more likely than the general public to be in a cell phone only or a wireless household, for Spanish speaking Latinos and immigrant Latinos, these numbers are much lower. There is a digital divide even within the Latino community. English speakers are more likely to be uh, engaged in using the internet and using Twitter, for example, versus Spanish speakers who are less likely to be so. But the gaps are closing. Second, poverty. The recession has hit Hispanics hard. In fact, in a recent report we released, actually just a couple of days ago, we reported some new public opinion numbers that showed that more than half of Latinos say that the Hispanic community has been hit harder by the recession than any other group. Now that's the perception of Latinos about what happened to them. What are the facts? Here's one of the facts. During this recession, the number of Latino children in poverty increased from 4.3 million to 6.1 million. There are now more Latino children in poverty than any other group. Now, why did that happen? Well, part of that is, is that the recession, which, was, which revolved around the housing bust in 2006, impacted Hispanic workers more rapidly early on, and uh, to some extent more than other groups. The Latino unemployment rate's 11%, the national unemployment rate's about 8%. Uh, when you talk about household wealth, it declined more for Latinos during the recession than any other group. So some economic challenges for sure, particularly given the current economic circumstances. Hispanics have been hit relatively hard. But what's also interesting about this is, is that Hispanics are optimistic. In our public opinion poll, we find that they're more likely than the general public to say they expect to be better off in the next year, financially. And they are very optimistic about the future standard of livings of their children. Two thirds say that they will be better than their own. I see a question. Yes. yes. Actually, one of the facts that why the Latino poverty is decreasing more than anybody else 
is because a lot of children, Latinos, are born in here, but the parents have no documents. Mm -hmm. And the immigration is being yeah. horrible all this year. It's yeah. being like a, a big attack yeah. to the Latinos population. So that yeah. maybe is one of the issues. Yeah. On, on the case of unemployment benefits, one of the things that we see is that Latinos are less likely than, the, than other Americans to take advantage of unemployment benefits nationally. So I'm not sure how much of it is uh, the immigration environment causing some, some problems or fears about going and taking advantage of services. I will also say that our estimates put um, uh, among the nation's unauthorized immigrant population, uh, there, are, uh, there are one million children who themselves are unauthorized. However, there are 4.5 million U.S. born children with at least one parent who's undocumented. So there's a large number of children. That's actually growing faster than, any, than the uh, undocumented immigrant uh, children's population. So there are 4.5 million children, U.S. born, with at least one undocumented parent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about uh, what issues Latinos see as important moving forward, particularly with, next year's, with this year's election. This is based off of a survey that we did in the fall, in November and December. And what Latino registered voters told us was the top issue for them was jobs, followed by education and health care. You'll see these are pocketbook issues, these are family issues. And these are issues that we've seen as a top three for Latinos over the course of the last decade. Now, I don't want to diminish the importance of immigration. Immigration is important too, and Latinos, a third, identify it as a top issue. But I do want to stress that we have seen more often in our surveys that it's jobs, education, and health care that are primary concerns for Latinos. So just as a side note, just to keep that in mind. Any questions? Yes. I think it, uh, to answer your question a little bit, yes. I think it has to do with the fact that more of us are becoming U.S. citizens mm -hmm. and that we can vote and we can make better choices. Yeah, yeah. And we're becoming more educated. That's right. Many times we learn through our children, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And instead of the other way around. Yeah. And parents who are not documented, it's that's through right. their children that they learn how the system works. Mm -hmm. And that's I right. think that's why uh, we're learning to make better choices. And immigration is important, but at least after I voted for Dr. Uh, for Mr. Obama, uh -huh. I was disappointed that instead of being in one war, which uh -huh. I was totally against because uh -huh. I had a son in yeah. the Air Force, yeah. uh, you know, that was, immigration was not important to me. Right. And also to a lot of mothers yeah. who had children in the armed forces. Yeah. So I think I was very disappointed that instead of being in one war, we were in three wars. Yeah. So, yeah. and I think that will be an issue yeah. in the yeah. future also. Let me, let me, let me, let me and summarize. Before I, and, be, and before I, I quiet down, yeah. um, I just wanted to go back. I was interested. Sure. First of all, I would love to obtain some of this Absolutely. information that you've given mm -hmm. us. Sure. And also, going back to Georgia, Georgia has been one of the states that have been the hardest mm -hmm. in the immigration problem. Mm -hmm. uh, how come or Hispanics or in a larger number in there? Mm -hmm. Or, or uh, is that yeah. a different, if there will used to be a difference before mm -hmm. ICE became so severe on them? Mm -hmm. uh, good question. Let me summarize a little bit about what you said for, because the translator can't hear in the back uh, your, your comments. Uh, so uh, she was saying that, uh, that looking at these issues and the issue list, it's, Im immigration is not so high because for many Latinos, particularly immigrant Latinos, they've become U.S. citizens and they've earned the right to vote. And after having done that, for them, particularly if we're talking just registered voters, right? And this is just registered voters, not all Latinos, but just registered voters, um, that among them it's issues like jobs or education or, 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 or other things that are of interest. In her case, particularly uh, being, uh, being excited about Obama initially, and then disappointed in the expansion of the U.S. war effort, particularly in, uh, in, in Afghanistan, and, now, and, and even though we've withdrawn out of Iraq, those are concerns uh, for her. On Georgia, uh, your question on Georgia was this. Why are there so many Latinos in Georgia? Georgia has, been, uh, has, has passed anti-immigrant -immig laws, has been aggressive in, in addressing immigration, at least at the state level. Um, uh, why are so many Latinos living there? I think that what it is is I think that in the in the early 2000s, 
the housing boom around Atlanta particularly. And if you look at those maps, you'll see it's in the Atlanta area and then Gwinnett County to the Gwinnett County to the northeast. That is where you see a lot of the Latino population growth. That was driven by the construction boom. So there's a lot of housing going on and a building going on and also uh, expansion in the agricultural sector as well. So Latinos were, uh, were migrated to Georgia, just like actually there's actually been a increase in the African-American population there that appears to be a return migration of, of African-Americans from the north to the south, particularly around Atlanta. Those two trends reflect the economic strength of the Atlanta area. And so I think that's why we see so many Latinos there. I also think, though, that it may be a reflection of how uh, uh, may, this fast, rapid growth may also reflect Georgia's concerns about what's happening. That's why they are moving forward with some immigration changes first, because they uh, went from relatively few to more uh, immigrants, and many folks were uh, concerned about the, the pressures that was placing on public services there. Thank so, you. You're welcome. Okay, um, next slide. Next slide. So let me tell you a little bit about D.C. So the Washington, D.C. area, here's what the D.C. area is comprised of. There are about 5.4 million residents in the D.C. area. Latinos are 14% of the area's population. Next slide. To give you some sense of how the population has grown, here's the trend in the Hispanic population uh, over the last uh, two, two decades. It went from 225,000 in 1990 to 772,000 in 2010. That's pretty big. If you think about it, that's a pretty pretty rapid increase. Now, Washington has been growing as well. So the Washington, D.C. area has grown, but the Latino population has grown along with it. Next. Now, to show you where this has happened, if you take a look, here's the biggest counties in terms of population in 1980. Next slide. There's 1990. Next. 2000. And 2010. So that gives you some sense of how big and how fast the Latino population has grown. As you can see, Montgomery County is actually one of the larger counties in terms of its Hispanic population. Next slide. In fact, um, behind Fairfax, Montgomery is second at 165,000 Latinos. In the state of Maryland, uh, more than a third of the state's Hispanic population is in Montgomery County. So Montgomery County has the, has, has, has the largest Hispanic population of any one of the counties. Um, and you can see that, that Montgomery and Fairfax alone account for a large share of the Hispanic population overall. So next slide. How do Latinos in Montgomery County differ from Latinos in the metropolitan area? Well, here's some facts. First, um, Montgomery County is more Latino than the general Washington, D.C. metropolitan area, 17% versus 14%. Um, share foreign-born, Montgomery County actually has a, a larger immigrant population or a larger share that's immigrant than the, than the share foreign-born across the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. And you can see that the median age of Latinos is younger than it is for non-Hispanic whites and non-Hispanic blacks. For non-Hispanic whites in Montgomery County, the median age is 45. For Latinos, it's 30. But you should also notice that Latinos here are older, a little bit older than the national number of 27. That's the median age for Latinos nationally. So there are some differences in the D.C. area, even in Montgomery County. Next slide. Also, Washington, D.C.'s population doesn't quite look the same as the one nationwide for Latinos. It's got this bimodal uh, uh, element to it. You can see it's got these, this sort of, it's got a couple of figures, I guess, right? It goes like this and like that. So it's got some youth and it's got some adults. I think it's in the process of growing and changing still. The Latino population nationally looks more like a pyramid, but you can see that for the Washington, D.C. region, this, the, because there are so many immigrants and most immigrants are adults, you see a bulge in the adult population for Washington, D.C. Next slide. Now, as I said to you earlier, Montgomery County is more likely to be foreign-born than, than Washington, D.C. It's even more so when you compare it to all Latinos nationwide and when you compare it to the general U.S. population. The general U.S. population is about 13% foreign-born. We are near a record high for that. Uh, it was about 14.5% 14, uh, 14 uh, foreign-born in the early 20th century for the United States as a whole. So we're nearing that record. However, uh, compared to the nation as a whole, Montgomery County's Hispanic population is more immigrant, more foreign-born. So, next slide. Now, I, I want to start by, by also talking about, because we've been talking about Latinos overall, 
the challenge is, is that Latinos are not all the same. And I'm reminded of that uh, uh, all the time whenever I give talks that, hey, you know, some are foreign born, some are immigrants, some speak English, some speak Spanish, some are bilingual, some are Salvadoreños, some are, are Mexican, some are Cubans. And, and I also always get the, the, the people always joke with me, not everybody's a Mexican. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> even though I'm Mexican, but you know, it's just that's why they that's why they joke around with me about it. So. But um, but when you take a look at Washington D.C., it's quite unique in many respects. Um, one of them is in the origin pop origins of its Hispanic population. Um, Thirty-four percent of the area's Hispanics are Salvadoran. Uh, for Montgomery County, that's thirty-nine percent. Um, it turns out that the Washington D.C. area is the nation's largest area, uh, largest Salvadoran area. What I mean by that is, is that the share of Salvadoran is higher here than anywhere else in the country. And Montgomery County reflects that. Now you'll see nationally, two thirds of all Latinos are of Mexican origin. But that's because in places like Los Angeles or Texas, you've got up to, there's, some, there's one county in South Texas that's like, of the Hispanics there, 99% are Mexican. So that you see a lot of counties, particularly in Texas and California, with more than three quarters of their Hispanic population being of Mexican origin. Next slide. To show you, one more, there we go. To show you how things differ across the country, look at how unique Washington is. You see the Salvadoran population at 34%. New York, the dominant groups are Puerto Rican and Dominican. In Miami, it's Cuban. In the Los Angeles area, it is Mexican. So when we talk about the diversity of the Latino community, there are multiple dimensions upon which it is diverse. It is not only about immigrant foreign born, it is not only about English and Spanish, it's also about country of origin. And on the East Coast, the diversity of the East Coast is really in that it is a diversity, a diversity that is not necessarily driven by a Mexican population. Out West, it's mostly Mexican in most metro areas. In Miami, as I noted, it's Cuban. In Atlanta, it happens to be Mexican. Philadelphia, Puerto Rican. Boston, Dominican. New York, New Jersey, it's Puerto Rican and Dominican. But as you can see, different parts of the East Coast have different groups that are the largest groups or the most, or, or the single, or the plurality of, of Hispanics in a particular area. Next slide. I want to finish by telling you a little bit about some uh, characteristics of Latinos in different places, particularly with an emphasis on Montgomery County. One of the characteristics of Latinos that distinguishes them is their levels of education compared to the nation as a whole. And generally speaking, Latinos have less education than the general population. In the Washington, D.C. area, 36% or about a third in Montgomery County, too, of Latinos ages 25 and older do not have a high school diploma. That does not mean they were high school dropouts. They may be high school dropouts, but they may be immigrants who arrived in this country, have met all the education requirements or wherever they were, came to the U.S., but when you, when you measure it against what we use here as measures in the U.S., it looks like they have less than 12 years of education. That means they probably don't have a high school diploma like we would consider it in the United States. Nonetheless, a third of Latino adults in the Montgomery County and Washington, D.C. areas do not have a high school diploma. You can see that that matches pretty closely to what you see for the U.S. Hispanic population overall, but higher for other groups, higher than for other groups. On median income, um, in terms of median income, Hispanics in the Washington, D.C. area are doing pretty well. Uh, the median household income for Montgomery County was 65000 in 2010, 62000 for all Hispanics. That compares, however, with 102000 median household income for white non-Hispanics in the Washington area. But you'll see that Hispanics in the Washington, D.C. area are doing better when it comes to household income compared to Hispanics nationally. For national, Hispanics nationally, uh, $40,000 is the median household income. Um, what about poverty? In terms of poverty, we here in the D.C. area are doing relatively well compared to other parts of the country, but the poverty rate still is above 10 percent. More than 1 in 10 of, uh, of Hispanics uh, in Montgomery County, more than 1 in 10 of all Hispanics in the D.C. area, 16% uh, of African Americans in the D.C. area uh, live in poverty. Um, now, those numbers are much lower than what you see for the U.S. population as a whole. Yes? What is the poverty line? What are we talking about? Yeah. 
Uh, it depends on the, on your circumstances, how big your family is and so forth. There are actually different measures of, of poverty, so it's hard for me to throw a single number out at you. But there is a lot of research on this, and what turns out to happen is no matter how you measure it, whether we say the poverty line for a family of four is 20000 a year or whatever, um, whatever it might be, uh, however we might adjust that, we do see similar patterns in the data. Latinos more likely to be living in poverty than other groups. Uh, poverty rates here lower than they are in other parts of the country. So uh, it, you see much of the same thing no matter how we measure it. Okay. Um, finally, I want to close by talking about the home ownership rate. So for Washington, D.C., the home ownership rate for Latinos is about half, 52%. Uh, 54 percent in Montgomery County. That's a little bit better than it is for for Hispanics nationally. Um, but of course, uh, we see a similar pattern in Montgomery County and in Washington, D.C. that we see nationally. That is that the home ownership rate for Latinos is lower than it is for non-Hispanic whites. I will also say, though, that during the uh, housing boom, and in fact, over the last uh, 10 years, even though there's been a slight slip in the national Hispanic home ownership rate, the Hispanic home ownership rate today is much higher, about 10 percentage points higher than it was in 1995. So there's been a lot of progress on home ownership among in the Latino community. Also, if you wanted to know which uh, Hispanic origin group has the highest uh, home ownership rates, that happens to be Cuban Americans. Uh, their home ownership rate is almost uh, equal to that of the national home ownership rate overall. Excuse me. And are they the highest earners? Do they earn more money? Uh, they, Americans? yeah, they are. They are close to the highest earners. I want to say it's Colombians who are the highest earners. Uh, they are uh, Colombians and Peruvians are also more likely to have a college degree nationally than any other any other Hispanic origin group, followed by Cubans. Thank yes. you. You're welcome. Any questions? Anything that I can answer? Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, with respect to immigration reform and the GMF, mm -hmm. do you know the numbers um, as far as undocumented out of status mm -hmm. and uh, residents and citizens for the Latino population? Mm. So, in total, in the United States, there are about 40 million people who are immigrants, who are foreign born. Of those 40 million, about 28% are unauthorized immigrants. That is, they're in the country and they're in the country uh, uh, without authorization. It's 11.2 million people. Um, now, those unauthorized immigrants are dispersed around the country. 80% uh, of them are Hispanic. 60% of those unauthorized immigrants overall are actually of Mexican origin. So when we talk about the unauthorized immigrant population, it's not all Latino, but Latinos are the largest share of it, with Mexicans being the single largest group. Also, when it comes to other statuses, among the nation's foreign-born, you'll find that um, I want to say about a third are naturalized, and then another third are legal, are here legally, but but there are uh, there are various steps or various parts of the process of getting there. So those are the numbers that we have overall. Forty million. Also, by the way, the United States has more immigrants than any other country in the world. There are actually more. Mexican immigrants in the United States than any other country has immigrants, in case you were wondering. See all the facts I have up here? Wow. I know, huh? Um, and uh, one interesting fact is that about one in ten of Mexico's population lives in the United States. And when you talk about people of working age, for men, it's one in five of all Mexican men between 30 and 45 are in the United States. So the United States, as, a, as an immigrant nation, is really quite unique. No other country comes close to it, the size of it, the characteristics, and so forth. But also that means that it has a large and authorized immigrant population as well, at least compared to other countries. Do you know what the stats are for the local level? At the local level, yes. Uh, I, I don't know them off the top of my head. I have to look them up. But we do have state estimates for each, for each state. So I could tell you what it is in Virginia, Maryland, and even the District of Columbia, how many unauthorized immigrants. Um, the Washington, D.C. area doesn't quite have as many unauthorized immigrants as you see in, say, California, where there's 2.5, 2.6 million, or Texas, where it's about 1.7 million. Those are the two largest states. But there has been a dispersion of the unauthorized immigrant population. California and Texas used to account for half. Now they're less than half. So there's been a real change in the dispersion of unauthorized immigrants. Okay, one last question. Yes. Does is that have to do with the fact that uh, they're dispersing throughout the country because of job loss? Or why, what is, why is the reason why we're moving all over the country into Alaska? 
Well, the unauthorized immigrant population is more likely to be participating in the labor market than the general U.S. population. So I think that what's, what, what has happened is they've followed where there are job opportunities. The story of Georgia, I don't think, is unique. It's actually a story of job growth, uh, population growth, expansion, and it drew not only uh, 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 Americans, uh, U.S. citizens, to work in Georgia, because many people did migrate to Georgia in the last decade. It also included unauthorized immigrants. So you see growth in various areas because of that. In the case of Katrina, you see an increase in the size of the, of the Honduran population in the New Orleans area during the last uh, half of the, uh, of the last decade. And they also have high uh, uh, jobs in the service industry. So. That's correct. They're overrepresented in construction, they're overrepresented right. in agriculture, and they're actually overrepresented in manufacturing. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, I had heard in some reports that mm -hmm. given the global recession, especially um, among the developed countries, that one of the concerns, for example, in Europe is that apparently the population is aging, mm -hmm. but they don't really have a lot of growth, you know, mm -hmm. the birth rate is right. down or anything. But that the only exception is the United States. And when we look at the statistics, and I'm just wondering if you're going to you know, elaborate on that, sure. it seems to me when I look at the statistics that what's saving us really is the growth mm -hmm. in the immigrant young people, especially the Latino um, youth, 18 right. and younger. Is that correct? That is correct. Latinos are more likely to, yes, the question was, um, uh, if you look nationally at, at demographic trends, you see particularly in a place like Europe that, uh, that the population of Europe is aging and it doesn't have an infusion of immigrants like the United States does, so that it doesn't have that replenishment of uh, the demographic replenishment that's happening here. Japan and Italy are extremes of this. Uh, Japan doesn't have immigrants coming in like the United States does, and it has an, a, an, a populated population that's aging quite rapidly, and they're facing a number of demographic challenges. Um, the, uh, the question is, how are Latinos? What's the story of Latinos in the demographics uh, changes that are happening here? Now, the United States has slowed down in its population growth, but if it weren't for Latinos, for example, in the state of New Jersey, the, Hispanic, the population of New Jersey probably would have declined and they probably would have lost congressional representation. If it hadn't been for Latinos in Michigan, the decline in population in Michigan would have been even more. So, and in Texas, Latinos accounted for 65% of, of that state's population growth and helped it get four congressional districts. So when we talk about the Latino population, it is where you have you do have more population growth occurring there. It is growing more rapidly. Um, you also have L Latinos, particularly immigrant Latinos, are more likely to live in families with children. So Hispanics, particularly immigrant Hispanics, particularly unauthorized immigrant Hispanics, have families. They're married. They have children much more so than the general U.S. population. So Latinos are an important part of the demogra growing demo the, the demographic story of the U.S. and could play a role in helping with many of the demographic challenges we're facing. I'd also add Asians as well, because for Asians, there are even uh, there are a greater share of them. More than half are foreign-born. Among Hispanics, it's 37 percent. So, yeah. good question. What's the source of uh, your data? Where does it come from? How do you collect it? Uh, data for uh, for all the things that I've shown you, or for the unauthorized immigrants? <laughs> both. Both. Oh. both. Um, we collect data in three separate, in two separate ways. Um, we collect data through public opinion surveys, and so the stuff that I showed you on issues is based off of a telephone survey of Latinos nationwide, both on cell phone and landline phones. Um, and that's one of the main things that we use, the vehicles we use to collect information. Second source is government data. The U.S. government puts out a lot of good data that's publicly available, it comes quickly, and we get pretty good pictures of the Latino community and the nation's uh, demographics overall every year through something called the American Community Survey, which is a tremendous resource for, for, for us. Um, in terms of unauthorized immigrants, there is no survey that exists that says, hey, are you here legally or not? You can just imagine who's going to answer those surveys. So we, we, in our surveys, don't ask that question in our surveys. We do ask people, are you a US citizen? And we do ask people in our public opinion surveys, are you, are you here legally or not? In other words, do you have a green card? And surprisingly, a number of people in our public opinion surveys say, no, I'm not a citizen. And no, I, I don't have a, a green card. 
more than likely they're not in the country with authorization. Um, so that's one way we get at it, but that's a really rough way. The second way is we know from government data a lot about people who, are in, who, who answer and say that they're foreign born. We know what jobs they have from their surveys. We know where they live. We have a good sense of their characteristics overall. Based on that, we can generate an estimate about whether or not that person is in the country legally or not. And our estimate of 11.2 million unauthorized immigrants is based off of that data, government data, but I want to stress that it is an estimate. It has a standard error. There's uncertainty. We don't know for sure how many unauthorized immigrants there are. You're welcome. I like the way you refer us to unauthorized instead of legal. Yes. Or, yes. So thank you. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 So I hope it catches on. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we, we use, uh, to answer your question, you know, we use the term um, um, uh, unauthorized in our reports because that's the term the Department of Homeland Secur Security uses. These are people who are in the country without authorization. It's descriptive. It's, it's, it's legally descriptive. Um, if you use the term undocumented, that's also a good term to use. We've shied away from undocumented partly because undocumented can capture a number of different circumstances. Unauthorized is legally the, the, the term, and that's a term that the Department of Homeland Security uses. Thank you. yeah, you're welcome. If there are no other questions, uh, thank you very much for taking the time to listen to me.